Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Cullen Brown. He's an Australian Research Fellow, Associate Professor at Macquarie University, Editor for Animal Behavior, and Assistant Editor of the Journal of Fish Biology. For years, he studied the behavioral ecology of fishes with a special interest in learning and memory. So thank you so much, A, for your work, and thank you for being on the program today. No, it's a pleasure, Derek. Um, so I guess my first question is, um, tell me about fish and tell me about, I mean, our, we often think of, or in the culture often thinks of fish as not being particularly smart, but you do research that suggests otherwise. Well, that's right. I've been working on fish behavior pretty much from my first day at university, which is going back a fair way now. And really, my interest in fish started when I was a little kid. I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia. Uh, my dad was uh, a salesman from American medical engineering company. So I spent a lot of time traveling around with him. And whenever he was working, more often than not, I had a pair of snorkels on and was messing around on the reefs watching the fish. So um, <clears throat> I think that's probably where my interest in fish started. And as soon as I had the opportunity, I... Uh, started working on fish at university and of course back then that was a fair while ago most people often thought of fish as these stupid things that swam around in bowls but did nothing very interesting of course i grew up seeing fish doing fascinating things in the real world and i had also had kept fish at various sorts in in fairly large aquaria it'd have to be said right from when i was about five or six so I think I had a pretty decent insight, and they certainly weren't as stupid as most people suggested. And the first thing that I figured out when I was a very little kid was that they seemed to recognize me. They certainly knew when I was going to feed them. Um, they sort of showed an anticipatory, anticipatory sort of behavior. But they, they seemed to recognize me as opposed to anybody else. They wouldn't get terribly excited if my sister or my parents approached the, the fish tank, but if I approached, they seemed to get very excited. So that's sort of where, where my interest started. And I guess the, the thing I really wanted to do right from the word go was to start addressing this question that, that fish are, are stupid. And the, the first thing that I thought, well, everybody seems to think that goldfish have this two-second memory. I don't. Every country is a slightly different version of the story. But in Australia, we have this uh, Golden Valley uh, orange juice that – has little facts underneath the lids. They're called little, uh, literally a, a pun on, on the lid. And the first fact was that goldfish have a two-second memory. And, of course, I was extremely angry about that. It obviously wasn't true. And, of course, I've been fighting this this sort of, I guess, common feeling that fish are, are stupid and have no, no memory for a long time. And it started with just by addressing how long can fish remember stuff for? Can you teach them things? I, it was obvious to me that you could. I soon proved that you could. And one of the first experiments I did during my honours year, which was really my first crack at real research, was to look at avoidance behaviour in uh, rainbow fish, which are a native Australian fish. You can pretty much catch them in any river or stream that you go to here. Put them in a tank, expose them to this sort of artificial trawl net which moved up and down the tank back and forth, and there was a hole in that net that they had to learn the location of that hole in order to avoid being caught in the net. And it took them five trials to figure that out. But they remembered that for a year. When I put them aside and tested them again a year later, they not only remembered, but they continued to improve their escape performance. So it was pretty clear from that moment that... The fish were learning rapidly, but once they'd learnt, they, they remembered it effectively for their lifetime, which is certainly better than my memory. <laughs> it's probably better than most people's. Well, I was I was just going to say that today I, I woke up and on the calendar was 5.30 p.m., do this interview, and I had to call a couple friends and say, if something happens during the day – remind me i have an interview at 5 30 i mean this this you know it's, or i'm going to go into town to do errands on thursday and i'm going to take a list because i won't remember between here and two miles into town that's right so most people's working memory is terrible and mine's mine's the same and in fact people used to tease me that i i study learning and memory because i, I well i can learn obviously but i'm no good at remembering things 
Um, and one of the other things I study also is um, brain lat laterality. I use fish as a model system there, looking at which hemisphere they use to analyze specific sorts of information. And it turns out that I don't know left from right either. So <laughs> there seems to be a common thread. Um, I, I want to back up for a second. Sure. And um, there was something you said early on about how you developed relationships with fish early on and mm -hmm. uh, you were reading something in the literature, but it wasn't matching your experience. Yeah, that's and, right. And um, it reminds me, I, w I was being interviewed by this guy from Nature Online a couple years ago, and I live mm -hmm. in the forest, and one of the things he was saying is that um, – Nature doesn't care if we destroy it because animals don't have any sense of self or sense of self-awareness or sense of self-enjoyment. And as he said this, I was looking out my window and there was a mother bear lying on her back in the grass with two babies playing on her belly. Yeah. And yeah. I said to him, are you trying to tell me that this mother bear is not enjoying the sun and is not enjoying playing with her children? Yeah. And he said, yes, I'm telling you that. And I said, and here's the whole point of me telling you the story. I said, have you ever had a relationship with a bear? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and he, said, he said, no, he, he was from the UK, and yeah. he had never actually seen a bear. And I see bear every day. Yeah. And so I just, I just want to bring in that. I don't know. So do you have any response to, to that notion of abstract understanding versus experiential ah. knowledge? Yeah, well, totally. Relationships? Totally. I mean, one of the things that – struck me there was a an article in the um in the newspaper in the u.s actually i saw it online recently and it basically was saying that kids today are actually afraid of nature instead of embracing it they're actually scared of it because they have no experience and no interaction with it which i think is a really terrifying thing and it's not surprising when you think about it you know people just are more inclined these days to stay in their flat, they walk down to the supermarket, buy some prepackaged meal that you can't really identify where it's from, stick it in the microwave and watch telly. I mean, that is so far removed from the real world. And if you don't have any experience with the real world, then you're never going to be able to relate to it. And if, I think if you don't have those personal experiences and, and uh, in-depth understanding of how the world works and, and nature and, and those sorts of things, then you're never going to accept that animals can play and feel joy or or might experience pain or, or all these sorts of things because you have no way of relating to it. Um, so I think that's that's a fundamental problem. And it's it's true of all animals in general, I think. Um, but it's certainly worse in fishes because there are so few people who have that kind of experience that you just described with a bear um, with fish. I certainly did growing up because I spent half my life with my head in the water. But, you know, the, the number of people who have those sorts of experiences is very, very limited. So tell tell me some of your – okay, in a little while I would like to talk about fish social relationships because you've studied mm -hmm. that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but let's let's leave that aside for a second. And can you just like spend, I don't know, just five or ten minutes telling telling people some of your favorite anecdotes of – fish and surprising behavior or just just sort of uh share with us some of your some of your favorite experiences or mm -hmm. um or observations of, of fish sure so one of the things that surprised me fairly recently i, I guess it's been a a slow build up to this set of observations but i i have a couple of colleagues around the world who basically do the same sort of work that i do looking at fish cognition. And one of these people is uh, Redwan Bushari, and he's based in uh, Switzerland, but he spends a fair bit of time in Australia working on the Great Barrier Reef, and he works on these little fish called cleaner fish. And we've known for a fair while that they're pretty smart little things. Um, they go out, they basically occupy these coral bombies, which is like a headland, if you like, of, of coral that sticks out from the reef. They're fairly territorial. You sometimes find them in pairs, but more often than not, they're by themselves. And they're basically what they do is they provide a service to a whole bunch of different fish that live in that area. Um, the cleaner fish, effectively, 
removes any decay or, or parasites or you know missing scales or dislodged scales or what have you from from their clients what we call client fish and the fish that come into these feeder stations do this special display to communicate to the to the cleaner that they want to be cleaned and they have this fantastic relationship and the fish the cleaner fish can remember the identity of literally hundreds of individuals um, which I think is amazing in its own right. But the other cool thing is that they tend to classify them. If they're predators, they treat them a little bit more, uh, I guess, carefully with a bit more respect than if they weren't predators. Um, turns out that these cleaner fish would sooner take a chunk out of their clients than they, than they would clean them simply because they, there's more protein value in taking a chunk out of the flesh. But <clears throat> they restrain generally from doing that. But they're more inclined to cheat, if you like, when that individual that they're cleaning is not a predator. They also classify them based on whether they're familiar or not. If they're not familiar, they actually prioritize these individuals that are passing through their territory because they know that the individuals that, that live in the, in the surrounding area have no option but to wait their turn to be clean. They've got nowhere else to go. But if there's a transient fish coming through, of course, the chances are that that individual may well go off and visit some other cleaning station. So they often, they often prioritise these transient uh, clients as opposed to the, the resident clients. Now, one of the cool things about this cleaner-client relationship is that there's sort of a mutual respect going on here. And both cleaners and clients can, can cheat in various different ways. So they have to trust one another to some extent. And there's a, a fair bit of evidence that suggests that the sort of trustworthiness of, 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 of the cleaner is an important factor when the clients choose who to be cleaned by. Now, when a cleaner accidentally hurts one of the clients, um, irritates them by doing something, and the client starts to swim off, they use a sort of reconciliation um, mode to convince the client to come back, and they, they basically swim off, chase after the, the client, and give them a back rub. And for a long time, we're none of us really understood why that would work as a mode of reconciliation. I mean, why would, why would a cleaner fish give a back rub using its pectoral fins to, to a client? And what does the client get out of that? And clearly it must be providing some kind of service or reassurance or something because otherwise the, the fish wouldn't be doing it. And recently these, uh, these chaps uh, in Red One's lab put in these rotating brushes into their aquariums just to see if the fish would come up and use them and basically give themselves a back rub. Turns out they do. So they actually enjoy having a back rub. And what's more, when they analyze the cortisol, which is like a stress hormone in the blood of both you know humans and, and in fishes, they found that fish that were giving themselves back rubs actually had lower cortisol. So they were, they were experiencing lower levels of stress. So it's like some sort of remedial massage, if you like. They're actually getting a reduction in stress. Presumably they're enjoying the experience. I mean, that's a bit you know, hard to say scientifically, but one assumes that you know humans like being back rubbed. If you were going to sample our blood while it was happening, I'm sure our cortisol levels would be going down too, and we'd obviously be getting some sort of pleasure out of that. So that, to me, was a really amazing set of findings, the fact that it went from this observation of these fishes giving these weird back rubs as a mode of reconciliation in the, in the wild to this, I guess, lab study that showed that it's reducing cortisol and they actually seem to be enjoying that sort of experience. So that, to me, was really eye-opening and it was something that I could relate to and I'm sure that most other people could relate to as well. Um, that's, yeah, thank you for that story. And, um, and don't they also at the, the, the cleaning stations, don't they, don't the fish sometimes line up too? Yeah, that's right. They do. They often line up. So they have to, especially the, the local resident, they often have to line up and, and wait their turn and they do. That's fine. Um, they tend to be reasonably orderly about these sorts of things. It's it's um, very much like a social function. <laughs> I guess it depends on what country you're in. But certainly in, in Britain and Australia and, and, and many Western countries, you, you do tend to line up and wait your turn for things, although that's not always the case in other countries. 
Um, but it seems to be very orderly. And so before we go, that, that seems like a great segue to social relations. But before we go there, mm -hmm. do you have any more, any more um, observations you'd love to share? Well, certainly. I mean, people come to me all the time and, and tell me various stories, whether they ring me or, or send me an email or send me a video or whatever it is. Um, I guess there are a couple of things that, that stand out. Over, over the time that have really sort of opened my eyes, I guess. There's um, various people have sent me videos of them training their animals, their, their fishes to do all sorts of strange things, you know, synchronised swimming, swimming in time to music, playing soccer in their aquarium, fetching things, swimming through hoops. And so I think there are a lot of people who perhaps spend even more time with, with their fish than, than I do. <laughs> And uh, they're constantly training their, their animals to do all sorts of fantastic things. And you, in fact, if you, if you YouTube and search, um, you know, smart fish, you can see all sorts of examples of these sorts of trainings that people have, have, have tr used to teach their fish to do weird and wonderful things. So that's a sort of common sort of thing that I, that I commonly get sent to me. The other thing that frequently people say to me, and this is mostly coming from um, anglers is that if fish are so smart, why do I keep catching them on, on my hook? And there was one chap who sent me an email just the other day. He was in his uh, tinny sitting over this coral reef and he was using pretty light gear and he kept on getting broken off. There was obviously some very big fish down there that kept on stealing his bait. And so after about 10 episodes, he decided he'd, he'd basically shift to a shark rig, rig which is a very significant hook and a very strong line. And he brought up this huge cod and this animal had, I don't know, 15 hooks stuck in its lip or something like that. And he basically said to me, you know, if, if fish are so smart, why is this animal constantly taking my bait and getting hooked? And, I mean, my reply was rather straightforward, and that is that if you were starving and one in – 10 or 1 in 100 of your hamburgers had a hook in it, do, would you stop eating? And the answer, of course, is no. You have to continue to eat because if you don't eat, you starve to death. So this is another really good example of, of how people's perspective of the world, of the wild in particular, is so far removed because they have no experience of hunger. They have no experience of, of desperation. You know, if, if food comes past in the, in the real world, Animals have to take that opportunity and grab it, even if there's some slight risk. And most people don't seem to understand that. Um, and it, it, again, you know, it just illustrates that people are completely disconnected from nature. Uh, yeah. And well, to to yeah, that's all. That's everything you say there is really great. And I, I, I immediately, as soon as he says something like that, I start thinking about all the stupid decisions I've ever made in my life too. And, <laughs> that's right. You know, it's it's like that's. You know, I was once almost in a fatal car wreck because I was opening my mail in the car. Mm -hmm. And it's like, seriously, I almost killed myself so that I could open my phone bill. I mean, that's yeah. – that's I wasn't even going to get food out of it, you know? And, <laughs> and yeah, we That can, was a very small reward for a huge risk. Yeah, exactly. It's like – or just getting in a car. You know, in the United States, there are about 50,000 people die every year in car wrecks. But we yeah. keep getting in cars or, you know, we can go through. I mean, let's not even talk about my decision on where I went to college. You know, it's like <laughs> we we all make stupid decisions. And so to it's just that in this case, the fish was paying with with either pain or death. Yeah, quite right. Well, certainly dancing with death. But, you know, in desperate times, you do desperate things. And for the most part, wild animals are hungry and they are willing to take risks and potentially, you know, hurt themselves to get access to food or some other resource. I mean, that's just a constant reality in the real world. Well, if we talk about sport fishing anyway, the I'm guessing, and I could be completely wrong on this, but I'm guessing the actual mortality from sport fishing is is fairly small. So it would be actually quite possible for a fish to go its entire life without actually encountering a hook. Well, quite right, yes. I mean, certainly recreational fishing, um, although increasingly, if you look at the world's fish stocks, they're in pretty dire straits. Oh, of there course. aren't too many places left that are, that are what would you call virgin, and certainly most fishers will have had 
well, not most, but certainly many will have had some sort of interaction with some sort of fishing gear of some some degree, perhaps not in uh, marine reserves, although, you know, the more we find out about the movement of fishes, the more we realise that, you know, we're probably underestimating the sorts of space that many of these large um, recreationally targeted fishes actually use. They often move between reserves into fishing grounds and, and back and forth. So, you know, I, there are probably few places left in the world where fish haven't come into contact with some sort of um, fishing tackle. But even then, the reward of, of, of a good feed still outweighs the risk. And, of course, the risk is going to vary depending on how popular that fishing location is and how many people actually go fishing there and that sort of thing. So well, I, you know, it's always the way. There's, a, there's going to be some benefits in terms of the food reward, but there's always a risk. I guess I just want to make one more comment about um, stupid decisions having to do with food, and mm. that's – I'm sorry. We put pesticides on our own foods, and <laughs> so, you know, that's – that's we can we can ask about the intelligence of that too. But, okay, yeah. so, so leaving that aside, so I guess there's a different direction before the social thing I want to go to, which mm. is you were talking about the hooks and the lips, and you, earlier you talked about the back rubs, and this goes to something that – I remember reading an article probably 10 years ago saying, oh, my gosh, fish actually feel pain, which yeah. was um, no surprise, I think, to anybody who's paying any attention. But um, <laughs> but nonetheless, it was at the time, I remember, fairly controversial. And so, can yeah. you, so, so before we get to social relationships, can you talk about pain just a little bit? Sure. So, in fact, I was uh... – working in the same lab when uh, Lynn described, well, she was one of the first people just to describe the pain perceptors in fish. And effectively at that time, from, from certainly looking down a microscope, you could not tell the difference between the pain perceptors in fish and the pain perceptors in, in, in humans. They're effectively the same thing. And we now know that, you know, looking at molecular data and that sort of thing, that, in fact, all of our pain perception um, neurons are derived from a fishy ancestor. So the only reason we can feel pain is because fish can feel pain. Um, so look, that was quite some time ago. I'm trying to remember when that was, probably 2003. So you're probably right, probably 10 years ago. And I guess... It's a bit like everything, isn't it? it there's always going to be some people out there who have um, a different perspective, perhaps often with a conflict of interest. But I was talking to this neuroscientist friend of mine the other day. He has a, a blog. And uh, he he compares these people who doubt pain perception in, in fishes to the Flat Earth Society. Um I also compare them to the people who don't believe in climate change. There are always a few people who just will not accept the scientific reality of the day, whether it's because they don't want to or whether because it's convenient for them not to um, or whether because there is a direct conflict of interest that, you know, it might mess up their day in some way, shape or form. Um, and so to me, really... Is, is it really an issue? I don't think so, but it continues to generate this massive amount of, of interest. Part of the reason why we have this constant debate is because I think the reality, or well, certainly the scientific knowledge that we have, hasn't filtered down into the general perception of people on the street. I mean, if you ask a person, a, any person that you bump into randomly in the street, you ask them what their uh, perception of fish intelligence is ask them directly whether whether they think fish are capable of feeling pain and 99 times out of 100 they'll say no they're stupid and they can't feel pain um so that's a really nice example of how science certainly needs to start at least being having their voice heard and informing um, public opinion because if you don't pay change public opinion obviously legislation and, and, and government's never going to change anything so that to me is a really nice example and in australia of course we're going currently going backwards on climate change for the very same reason because our prime minister doesn't believe in it um he's i reckon he's also a member of the flat earth society but you know 
some people's minds you just will not be able to change, no matter how much evidence you put before them. So, so let's let's move on to um, the question of of social relations and. Mm -hmm. Um, once again, we've we've you know the, the sort of standard mythology in the culture has been, as you've said, stupid. They don't feel pain. They're just sort of these bits of protein that somehow move around. Yeah, um, automatons. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but um, I've even heard I don't remember which species of fish this was, but there was it's a it's a deep sea fish that is long lived, mm -hmm. um, who um, their their social behavior has been described as quote Machiavellian, mm -hmm. um, which I'm not sure is a compliment. Um, <laughs> but so so can you talk about the social relations in fishes on 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 any level that you want? Yeah. So I mean, let's start where you, where you led off. So I don't know how much people will know about Machiavelli, but he basically served the princes of Venice, I think about 1400, and he wrote a, treat, a treatise which is called The Prince. Of course, it's in Italian or Latin, as the case may be. Um, and in it, he basically said, if you want to be a powerful person, um, what you need to do is manipulate people to your advantage. That fundamentally is the take-home message from his treaties and of course he very nearly got burnt at the stake by the church for saying these sorts of things and I suspect the reason they were burning him because that he was voicing the sorts of approaches that they'd been using for centuries to manipulate people and that aside basically what what they're suggesting is that because social relationships can be complicated and in order to manipulate these sorts of relationships you need to be relatively smart. You need to be a bit savvy about how you talk to people, who you talk to, um, who you might give gifts to, uh, and these sorts of things. When do you provide pats on the backs? When do you shout at people? Those sorts of sorts of things. Um, so the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, in its simplest form, basically stipulates that in order to keep track of these complex relationships, you really need to be smart, you need, and you need to have a large brain to do that. Now, probably in the early 80s, there was a couple of books that came out that basically said, ah, well, the Machiavellian uh, intelligent hypothesis explains why primates have these ridiculously large brains. Of course, the assumption was that this was also the case for humans. We have these complex social relationships, uh, and so we need big brains to keep track of them. Now, for a while, it was like, ah, oh, well, um, that kind of makes sense for primates. Soon, of course, they discovered that similar sorts of things seem to be happening in birds. Um, that is that in birds that have fairly, uh, well, I wouldn't say large, but intermediate levels of um, social relationships and meaningful social relationships. I'm not talking about massive flocks of starlings or anything like that, but particularly those that live in social groups, they tend to be related to one another and that, those sorts of things. They have meaningful social relationships. They also tend to have relatively large um, parts of the brain that's associated with sociality. Um, so you get a similar sort of relationship when you look at group size in primates and group size in birds as the group size goes up, goes up so too does the sort of cognitive part of the brain that, re that is responsible for social relationships. Now, for a long time, that was pretty much where it sat. But, you know, if you think about this relationship, the more you realise that it's actually a general rule. It's, it doesn't just apply to primates and humans. It certainly applies to birds as well. And I would say that it applies probably to all animals that live in these complex social groups. And, of course, fish are renowned for their complex social groups. Now, Again, I mean, you'd have to stress that we're not talking about huge shoals of, of uh, sardines that number in the millions. You can't possibly have meaningful relationships um, with all those individuals. But we already know, for example, that guppies, and everybody will know guppies, if you go to any old fish shop, you'll find guppies there in the fish tanks. Now, guppies can keep track of the individual identity of perhaps up to 14. Nobody's ever gone much beyond that. 14 other individuals, they 
if you give them a choice between familiar individuals and unfamiliar fishes, they nearly always hang out with familiar individuals, much as the same as you and I would if we went to a party. Unless you're particularly extroverted, you're much more likely to spend a significant time hanging out with your friends than, than strangers. So fishes are doing that. They're also able to keep track of social relationships, and they can do that directly um, by interacting with specific individuals. So say in a hierarchy, they can figure out by interacting with individuals, oh, well, this guy's tougher than me, I'll remember that and I'll avoid him in future encounters. And they also know who's lower than them in the hierarchy. But not only can they do that directly, they can do it from a third party perspective as well. So they don't even have to be engaged. They can watch two other individuals interact and they can judge the relative position of those other individuals relative to themselves on the hierarchy. So just by watching. So we're already getting pretty complicated here in terms of keeping track of who's who. The other cool thing that fishes can do, and I guess most people won't be aware of this sort of thing, is that when males in particular are fighting one another, they really only do it for two reasons. The first is to prove to the other male that they're better quality and thus higher in the hierarchy, or they're showing off to the girls to say, look, I'm tougher than this guy, you should mate with me. Um, which is pretty much standard issue in most societies, including human societies. Um, but the interesting thing is that the manner in which males interact with each other during these displays actually depends on who's watching as well. So if another male is watching, for example, the two males who are interacting tend to be more aggressive because they're trying to you know, prove to the third party observer that you know they're pretty tough and you don't want to mess with me if on the other hand the observer is a female they tend to tone down their aggression and start doing more displays so instead of you know biting and, and bashing into each other they tend to use their fin displays and show off their colors and all those sorts of things so they're actually changing their behavior and their interactions with other individuals depending on who's watching them so i, I think those sorts of things are pretty sophisticated and we've already suggested that um, they have this modes of reconciliation and, and cooperation. We know that fishes cooperate with one another. So once they've identified particular individuals, they can assign sort of social values to them as well. So, for example, if you have two fish that are inspecting a, a predator, they tend to take it in turns because it's a fairly dangerous thing to do. So they each have a go at taking the front position. And uh, if one of those two individuals should cheat, perhaps by holding back or not doing its fair share of the dangerous front position, in future encounters, the partner will refuse to inspect predators with that individual, the cheater. So I think all of these things add up to suggest that, you know, most fishes that live in these social, complex social groups have this very high level of, um, I guess, cognitive ability to keep track of who's who. And in fact, if, again, like primates and birds, if you look at the brains of social fishes, they also have exceptionally large areas of the brains associated with sociality. So this is exactly the same picture as you see right across probably all vertebrates. So <clears throat> do you, um, when you were talking about the social creatures and then when I was just remembering about the um, – you know the creatures um, with with these complex social relationships and and um, you know I I'm going to ask this question but I really hope that nobody ever does any scientific studies on it um, I'm just <laughs> I'm just asking this sort of anecdotally yeah do you think that then that fish experience PTSD and I'm thinking about when they you know if, if you have this complex society and mm. Um, some sort of trawler comes by and takes most of the community. Um, do the other? Do you think that the other fish suffer um, cognitive? S okay, I would use the word emotional. I don't know if you're comfortable with it, but do, do, yeah, yeah. Do, do, okay. Yeah. Do you do you think they suffer cognitive slash emotional? Do you think yeah. they, they, they? I I'm just stammering. So you, so you can either answer that yeah. or not. It's a good question, and in fact, I recently had a, uh, a visit from a, a researcher from Europe who was spending time in Australia, and 
she actually works on exactly this, not in fishes, but in, in birds and particularly in corvids and parrots. Um, and there is certainly some evidence, uh, certainly in primates, elephants, um, obviously humans, perhaps dogs, that when a closely related or a social um, companion is killed or removed, um, then they obviously have some sort of trauma associated with that. It, in fishes, it's very difficult to know. And in fact, I don't think anybody's actually ever looked at it. But, you know, to be honest, it wouldn't surprise me because there are plenty of examples of um, monogamy, for example, in, in, in fishes. So in terms of sexual relations, fish do everything. They do everything from, you know, male parental care to female parental care to bi-parental care to just about everything you can imagine, you know, group spawning, you name it. They do it all. Um, but there are plenty of examples of long-term um, stable relationships not only between uh, males and females, but within social groups, um, usually family. Uh, and there are examples of you know other individuals that help at the nest and all those sorts of things, help defend the territory, feed the, feed the young or care for the young. Um, so certainly my intuition would say, yes, it probably does happen, but as far as I'm aware, there's no data one way or the other. Okay, I'm going to... We've got like seven or eight minutes left, and mm -hmm. um, okay, this this is not yet sort of a wrap up question. This is this is just something else that's occurring to me, and I'm asking you this as a human being and not as a scientist. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just in your gut, you know, once again, I'm not asking you to scientifically defend anything, and I'm not asking you to put a scientific reputation on the line, yeah. but in your gut, and the kid who would who was, you know, swimming around, what? What emotions do you – what emotions would you be comfortable as a human being mm -hmm. believing that fish feel? You mentioned – I think you mentioned joy early on and then yeah. you – you know, once again, I'm not asking you to scientifically defend it or put a scientific reputation. Just yeah. as a human being, what do you – what do you – what what is your – what is your guess? Well, look, I'll start off with my science hat on. Okay. We know for sure about fear and anxiety. There's no doubt about that. So how does that no manifest? Problem. Well, fear is obvious. <laughs> it's the same, same as any animal. Right. Um, uh, the fish not only, you know, have innate fear responses to certain things, but they can also learn to fear things, and obviously they can make associations between certain places and and fearful events and those sorts of things, and they tend to avoid them. In the, in the future. Um, so if they encounter a predator, for example, in a particular location or a microhabitat or have you, they tend to avoid that location. Um, and if you constrain them to that location, then they do suffer from anxiety. So, um, and again, you can measure all sorts of physiological responses to show that they, they are doing that, increased stress and so on and so forth. So there's, there's no doubt um, about those sorts of things. Pain, I think we've already covered that. I don't think any reasonable scientist, certainly in neuroscientists, nobody would argue that um, that they don't feel pain. As far as I'm concerned, it's a bit like saying animals with eyes can't see because they're not the same as humans. It's a bit stupid. Um, obviously, we have the same sensory capabilities, so I think the pain thing we can tick off. Joy, I mean, just yesterday somebody sent me a video of um, some fish in an, in an aquarium chasing a laser pointer dot around the, the aquarium. And they said to me, are these fish pl playing? And my immediate response was, no, I'm a scientist. Um, it looks to me like it's foraging behavior. They're basically chasing the dot to see if they can eat it, um, which I think most scientists would start at that. Can we explain this at the simplest level before we start getting complicated? That's not always true of anthropologists, and it's certainly not true of primatologists. They tend to start with complexity rather than starting with simplicity. Um, so, yes, I think I think fish do play. I've certainly seen um, fish playing in currents, both in the wild and in captivity. There doesn't seem to be any kind of 
benefit to that sort of behavior in terms of you know access to food or avoiding predators or, or what have you there, there doesn't seem to be any kind of reason for it um, and so when you start to see those sorts of behaviors that you just can't explain then obviously one possible explanation is that the animals are playing of course there are a whole bunch of people who study play in animals and many of them actually say, well, actually, there is a benefit to play. You, you learn to, to do all sorts of things, whether it's you learning about social relationships or learning to handle prey items or, or you know, learning to fight or, or what have you, that, that maybe there are benefits. But I think in general, most people would accept that when animals are playing, they do it first and foremost because it's fun. Certainly as a kid, that's what when I'm, when I'm playing, I'm doing it because I'm enjoying it, not because I'm practicing for some you know, future life event. And so I, I suspect fish probably do play. Um, well, what does joy mean? I don't know. Um, certainly, you know, when I am playing and having fun, then I'm obviously experiencing joy. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, when these fish are getting this back rub, they're obviously getting some kind of psychological benefit from it, a, a reduced stress. Presumably they're enjoying the, the experience. So um, I would be reasonably comfortable with that too. So I don't know. This, this doesn't leave us much left that's uniquely human. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about joy. And one of, the, one of the most fun examples that I can remember of joy that I've seen among non-human animals is when chickens – are let out of a coop, especially when they're young, <laughs> and they do this really happy dance in the sunshine. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I wonder. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. So I guess the last question. We got like two or three minutes left, and yeah. um, I think I mean I, you've you've delivered some just fantastic information. What would you want? So somebody's listening to this. What? How do you want this to affect them? What What should people actually do with this information? that how do you want this to affect both people's lives and the larger and larger society yeah so look one of the things that i suspect scientists don't like to do is get involved with informing public debate and 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 getting involved with management decisions and 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 government policy and those sorts of things which is a bit weird scientists tend to say well look Here's all this information. Take it or leave it. You do with it what you will. Um, but I think we've got to the point now, particularly with fish cognition and pain perception in particular, because they have such huge animal welfare implications. I mean, you think of the number of fish that humans interact with. You know, they're the most popular pet in the world, numerically speaking. Uh, there are second only to mice in terms of animal experimentation. They're unequaled in terms of our harvest from wild populations for protein. And we also have, obviously, a massive number of fish in, under intense aquacultural conditions, which is basically the, the equivalent of modern industrial agriculture. And... So oh, I should also mention that there are more species of fish on the planet than, than all other vertebrates combined. So there's a huge number of ways that humans interact with, with fishes. And because of that, there's obviously an overwhelming um, implication from an animal welfare and animal ethics perspective. If we're treating them poorly or underestimating their ability to, to feel pain or what have you, then clearly we're doing a, a massive disservice uh, to fishes generally, but to to the to the to wildlife more broadly. Now, for me, the main thing that comes out of all of this is that you know fundamentally there's there's really no difference between fishes and any other animal or any other vertebrate anyway. And so, my expectation is that you know when people go fishing. I should not differentiate between fishing and hunting for any other animal. It's effectively the same thing. Um, so if, you, if you're going to go fishing or hunting, and I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying think about it from an ethics perspective, an animal welfare perspective, and if you're going to kill an animal, do it fast and, and do it effectively and efficiently. 
to minimize um, stress to the animal. Um, now, that's in a hunting fishing perspective, and both in in America and in Australia, there's a massive recreational um, fishing group, and they're politically quite powerful as well. For a while, they actually had the balance of power in Australia in the Australian government. Now, that's just the recreational perspective. But what about commercial fisheries? What about um, the implications that this might have for aquaculture? Now, at the moment. Basically, there is no legislation that controls um, commercial fisheries and aquaculture um, from an animal welfare perspective. But if you think about it, it wasn't that long ago that similar sorts of um, attitudes were taken to terrestrial um, agriculture. And it's relatively a modern um, thing that you know people are starting to think about the welfare of chickens so you know everybody's into free-range chickens now there's all sorts of rules about providing egg laying hens with a certain amount of space and a certain substrate so they can dust bathe and, and all that sort of thing you know we tend not to cram pigs into tiny containers now and so there are all sorts of rules and regulations that came across about how we interact and, and manage agricultural terrestrial agricultural animals that revolution stopped at the water's edge it never had it never had any influence on fishes and fishes have always been treated separately from the rest of the animals i suggest that what we need to do is and i'm going to use a terrible pun here but we, we really need to see a, a sea change a similar sort of revolution in aquaculture and uh, the fisheries industry now you can imagine the sorts of implications that might have um, there are huge problems trying to get some sort of welfare legislation um, attached to, to fisheries operations. And I, frankly, find it very hard to come up with any methodology that you can mass collect fish from the wild in a humane way. Um, you just think about how you know a modern trawler works. They put out a net. They pretty much catch everything more or less indiscriminately. They bring it up from some depth, dump it on the deck, spend some serious amount of time sorting it. Half the stuff goes back overboard. It's pretty much dead. The chances of recovery is virtually zero. Everything else that's left pretty much suffocates <laughs> to death on the boat, and eventually it's put into ice um, for storage. So there are so many issues <laughs> with that scenario from an animal welfare and ethics perspective that I can't even begin to start. So all of those problems would have to be overcome. So it's a pretty significant problem, and you can imagine why there are those out there who just do not want to tackle the problem. Um, it's too hard. The amount of money that's sort of involved um, in commercial fisheries around the world is massive. The amount of investment that's already been put into that is huge. So there's going to be a huge political backlash if that sort of thing was ever suggested. But I think we, you know, from a, from an ethics perspective, we really need to go there. Well, at one point, it was considered acceptable to put human beings in slave ships and cart them across the Atlantic Ocean. And yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, so I just. I want to thank you for taking such a courageous stand, and I want to thank you for taking the first steps toward helping to bring about just what you were describing um, and for bringing this information to people. And I would also like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Colin Brown. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.